What is the reason that we are acting not just selfishly all the time, that we are sometimes acting on behalf of others as well? So one possibility is that we learned this from our parents or other adults. More generally speaking, maybe we have absorbed the norms of our culture that tell us that it's a good thing to be altruistic and a bad thing to be uh, selfish. And there's very good reason to believe that there's some truth to this. After all, society really values altruistic individuals and does not like selfish individuals uh, very much. And also in scientific studies with adults, we find that adults think about the implications and the social norms of their behaviors, and that might lead them to be uh, more altruistic in certain situations than others. However, is this everything? Are we born selfish? And it, it, it is upon social norms that overdevelopment reprogram us towards becoming altruistic uh, as well. And as Maria mentioned, very many people and the predominant view in many disciplines is that children are kind of selfish and then it is really upon society to change that. What I want to do today is convince you that this commonly held belief is wrong. And I want to take you on a journey to the starting state of altruism, trying to understand what is there early on before socialization could have had a major impact on children early in life. For me, this journey began when I was a starting PhD student, and I was wondering, are children clever enough to understand that someone who is fiddling around with keys is trying but failing to do something um, has a certain goal in mind, and are they willing to help this person, just like in the dropped key example from the parking lot? And my advisor said, nah. Like, if you drop something in front of a toddler, they want to keep it. Like, who was I, starting PhD student? Okay, they must be right about that. But then, when I was studying um, a toddler for a different kind of experiment, the opportunity arose. Um, a ball I was playing with was rolling away, and then with this idea in the back of my mind, I thought, huh, maybe I'll test this out. And I pretended that I couldn't reach the ball, and sure enough, the toddler went over, picked up the ball, and put it into my hand. So maybe young children are helpful after all. So this led to a series of experiments to understand better um, the situations in which children may or may not help. Let us look at one of these situations. Here, you see me on the split screen, standing on the right, hanging towels on the clothesline, and then I accidentally drop a clothespin on the floor. And while I'm doing that, an 18-month-old toddler is watching. So what I found in this study is that children in this kind of situation in which I drop something ex accidentally, they will frequently pick it up and give it to me, right? However, you might wonder why exactly is this child doing that? Maybe the boy thinks that um, clothespins don't belong on the floor, or they just give it to me because they want me to repeat the action, or they just see this as an opportunity to interact with me. So this is why in this task we included a control condition here in red where it was the same basic physical situation, but it do did not present a problem to me. So namely, I would stand there and throw the clothespin on the floor and not reach for it. But in this case, children don't pick it up and give it back to me. So by contrasting this experimental condition in which the clothespin on the floor was a problem because it did not match my goal, they helped. And in a control condition in which they could do the same thing, but it wouldn't help me, they wouldn't do it. So maybe they are actually quite helpful. Let's look at another situation. So in this case, I first put a stack of magazines into the cabinet, then went to the other end of the room to get more magazines, and then this happens. Oh.
All right, again, we found that in a situation like this one, children would frequently open a door so that I could put my magazines inside. And this is different from a control condition in which I also bump into the doors. However, previously, I had put magazines on top of the cabinet. And now, the closed doors don't present an obstacle to my goal, right? And in this case, as you can see, none of the children ever opened the door. So this shows us that they're not just reminded about how much fun it is to open doors or they think something interesting is in there. It seems like, really, this behavior has something to do with my goal. So, when you see these kinds of situations, it's kind of impressive and certainly funny, um, but you might wonder, um, can they infer a goal they have never seen be achieved? Because in these situations, they have seen me before achieving my goal, so maybe they're just reminded of this. But then we created a situation in which the children actually had never seen me complete my goal. I was so clumsy that I always failed. So this is the following situation in which I sit on the right, again, the split screen, and an 18-month-old across the table from me on the left. So here, even though the children had never seen me put a book on top successfully, they would help me with this, as seen in this experimental condition. However, if I put the stack of books in front of them and the other books around it, they didn't do that. So they didn't just want to build towers whenever they have the opportunity. It seems like it really has something to do with my goal. So the next question you might ask is, are they able to help in a situation that they have never experienced before. So in these kinds of situations, you could imagine that they've seen this before at home, they have been in that situation themselves, and maybe their parents have told them what to do. So what we did to explore this possibility is we created a situation that they could not have potentially experienced before by introducing a box that has a flap on the side and a hole on top. And another experimenter previously showed them this novel box that they have never seen before, and they successfully opened the flap. And then later, I come into the room with my coffee cup and a spoon, and then this happens. Oh. oh. Yeah. <gasps> All right. So what we found, again, in this situation that you saw here, children would help by retrieving the spoon from me and giving it to me, but they would not do that in a control condition in which I throw the spoon into the hole on purpose and don't reach for it. So again, it seems like their act has something to do with my intended goal and not just the objects in front of them. So um, after finding that the children are quite clever in their helping, you might ask whether they maybe have nothing better to do in these kinds of situations than to help me, right? So how boring to just hang out with mom or something. So maybe this is the reason. So to investigate whether children are willing to help when it's a bit more costly, we created this situation where, just like in the clothespin task, an experimenter is writing something and then drops a pen on the ground and is reaching for it. But this time, this two-year-old is having fun in the ball pool. Mama. Deine, ja. 
So what we found in this study and several others is that children are actually willing to put some effort into helping. And as the word toddler, toddler already says, they are not quite as good at walking. So when we put up a whole parkour in front of them where they have to surmount obstacles, they continue to help. And when they have to pay opportunity costs by disengaging from a fun activity, they're also willing to do that. So it indicates that children really are willing to, to put some effort uh, into helping. Um, what you might have noticed in these situations is that there's always a very salient cue, a behavioral and often a facial cue, that there is a problem, someone reaching for something, someone bumping into the doors. But when we think about adults, it is the case that we also help often without any of these overt cues. So this might be a situation where someone is walking along the street and drops their wallet, right? We might run after the person and give the wallet back. Or if there's a job opportunity, you might remind a colleague or friend about that. So we often proactively help others. So the question now was, will children help when these overt behavioral concurrent cues are absent? The way we tested this was, um, is displayed here. So this is a bird's eye view of our experimental set setup where an experimenter is uh, putting cans away into a, a basket, um, but importantly, she's doing that turned away from the child who is having fun playing a game on the left, okay? And so what happens is that she usually is able to put her cans into the basket, so this is all fine, but then without her noticing, suddenly a can rolls off the table. So the question is, will children help in this situation? So here's a video uh, of a two-year-old um, who witnesses how she's doing stuff over here and then a can drops down. And there, I'll put that one here. I know. And then let's see, I've got this one. This one's, this one's, this one's, this one's for the big box. All right, and what we found is that starting around two years of age, children are willing to help in this situation, so they're able to understand that even though the person did not even notice it and therefore could not provide any cues, this is not what she wanted, and I will help her with this.